So now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our keynote speaker for this afternoon, Derek Hoshika. And just on a personal note, I've worked with Derek uh, over the past few years, uh, and uh, he and I, have, I think, have been partners on a couple of things related to TCAT work, uh, including uh, working with the local Hispanic community and some other efforts. And TCAT, or, uh, Derek was actually one of the presenters at a forum that we held at Traditions about two years ago. And so I'm really appreciative of the work that Derek has done, not, not only uh, in the Northwest, but for, uh, with and for us here in, here in Thurston County. Uh, Derek is a community supported organizer with For the People. He is launching a bold project, Rapid and Just Climate Action, organizing with communities in Washington State to stop global warming, to stop global warming within 10 years by building broader, more inclusive movements through anti-racist, anti-patriarchal, and intersectional organizing, and by supercharging organizing with innovative capacity building tools. For him, the climate crisis became personal and urgent during a life-changing 1,000-mile bicycle pilgrimage along the Trans Mountain Pipeline to the tar sands in northern Alberta, Canada. Derek serves on the boards of E3 Washington and Salish Sea Cooperative Finance and has worked for change at many organizations such as Greenpeace USA, Climate Solutions, Cascadia Climate Collaborative, Yes Magazine, Seattle Good Business Network, and Web Collective. So please, please join me giving a warm welcome to Derek Hoshika. Thank you. Good afternoon. How's the day going? You getting some food? Excellent. Yeah, thank you for, for uh, having me here. Thank you to the organizers again. Thank you everyone for being here. I want to especially thank Candace for creating uh, a great welcome and, and opening our space in a good way. So just want to really appreciate that. Uh, my name is Derek Hoshiko. I'm a fourth generation Yonsei, Japanese American. I'm living on the traditional land of the Snohomish people, which is uh, also known as Whidbey Island. And uh, yes, I completely uh, want to appreciate uh, Tom, uh, especially for making opportunities to um, be connected in Olympia. And uh, thanks to Lynn Fitzhugh for, for working with me to make it possible for me to be here and share some words with you. Thanks to the hosts of uh, uh, in Olympia who have welcomed me for the past three days at a, a couple of other climate events as well. So just uh, hands up to you all. Um, so I'm here to share a call for climate action, a call for rapid and just climate action. And I'm going to spend the majority of my talk sharing this document that is hot off the press, that is not yet even released into the world, but this is the, uh, one of the few first copies of it. And it's a uh, five-page document, and I'll be sharing quite a bit from that. And it has two parts. One is a declaration of emergency, and the other part is a set of principles of organizing. And I would like to think that these principles will support the action planning that's going to be happening this afternoon and that hopefully you'll be able to take some of what I'm sharing with you throughout the day and into the future. I also want to uh, mention a trigger warning that some of what I might be sharing could trigger folks in a variety of ways. Um, if you were at my workshop this morning, please stand up if you're willing. If you've taken anti-racist or anti-patriarchy training, please join the folks standing and stand up. And if you know one of the people standing up, please stand up. <laughs> Thank you. So you know who's in the room that are allies and co-conspirators in this important work of climate justice. Thank you. So maybe some of what I say is going to be uncomfortable. Maybe it's going to trigger emotional reactions. 
and I ask that you sit with those emotions and confront them and confront your reactions and maybe some of the folks that were standing can be allies to you in helping you to process what comes up. So first, how many people think that climate change is the problem that we need to solve? Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a reasonable response at a climate conference. And uh, how many folks raise your hands if you think that climate change is the only issue that matters? Not so many hands. We need to get at and focus on the issues that are the root cause of the climate crisis. It's not the greenhouse gas emissions. Do you think that stopping greenhouse gas emissions alone will lead to a sustainable and just future? Getting a lot of no nods. So there's a lot of uh, analysis in the room already. So you may have heard that we need systems change. The systems change that we need is changing and undoing the systems of oppression, patriarchy, colonization, capitalism, racism. So we need to bring everyone along in this transition. We can't throw people under the bus anymore. We can't have sacrifice zones. We can't exclude people in our movements, in our meetings, in our gatherings, in our breakout sessions. There is a place for everyone in this movement. We also must move from what we think is politically possible or our assumptions about what is possible and move to doing what is necessary. Uh, there's a, I'm into sci science fiction and there's a, a film, uh, Interstellar, which is a climate change film, Klee fiction, Klee, I don't know how you say it, climate science fiction. And um, there's a scene in the film where uh, the, this antagonist has like uh, basically destroyed the base station that is the only means of survival. But the people who are witnessing this are in a shuttle. And so they're in the shuttle, comfortable, witnessing this destruction of their base station. And it's spinning out of control and hurling towards the planet. And they, the um, protagonist in the film says, we can't let that base station crash into the planet. We have to save it. And then one of the people said, that's not possible. He says, but it's necessary. I've worked with organizations who say that they're working to stop global warming who aren't willing to do what's necessary. I've, I've been in conversations with folks who say we can only do what's politically possible, but I say that with people power, we can change what is politically possible so that we can get what is necessary. We need policy science and technology to be accountable to and follow the lead of the grassroots. How many folks in this room would identify as a community member? We need the elected officials, the staff of elected officials, the people who are working in nonprofit organizations, the consultants, the businesses, to all be accountable to the people. And the time has also come to move from intention to impact. There are a lot of good intentions out there. I am well-intentioned, but what's important is to move from being well-intentioned to understanding the impact that we're having on each other, on the planet, on de how decisions are made, and to broaden our consciousness to create a spiritually active movement. And the last thing before I jump into the principles is that we need to stop doing things that are counterproductive or are uh, unproductive. And so a lot of folks get caught up into the trap of being busy. Raise your hand if you think that you're busy. Okay, let's get a different show of hands. Raise your hand if you think that you're not busy. Okay, I'm gonna be so bold as to say that busyness is a manifestation of whiteness. 
It's also a manifestation of privilege. It is a privilege to be busy and to not have the capacity to show up for the community, for the people on the front lines, for the people in low status communities, for immigrants and refugees, for people of color, for queer and trans people. So I challenge us to step away from the mental and um, white construct of busyness and liberate ourselves. And part of that is examining what are the things that we do on a daily basis that prevent us from being able to show up? And what can we stop doing to create time and space and energy and money to be able to show up? So I'm gonna read a bit from this declaration. Article one, emergency declaration. We must limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. There is less than a 1% chance of achieving this. There is no existing institution or government that is working to achieve this other than you, me, and us. We, the undersigned people of color, native and indigenous people of the Coast Salish territories, Washingtonians, Washington-based organizations and institutions and national organizations operating in Washington state, hereby declare in a, a climate emergency and call upon fellow residents, communities, businesses, organizations, and local governments throughout the state of Washington to fundamentally transition and transform our economy and our society into one that is just and sustainable within 10 years. We should call this work rapid and just climate action. So whereas the International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, released a report in October describing ways to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Raise your hand if you've read that report or read of that, about it or knew about it. So many of you have. And I'm curious, how many people, raise your hands if you thought that was a wake-up call. Now, raise your, uh, other folks, raise your hand if that was old news. So mixed bag, half and half. Um, Eric Holtus explains that beyond this limit, the planet really starts to go haywire and that hitting this goal would, radically, would, would require a radical rethink in almost every aspect of society. But the report finds that not meeting this goal would upend life as we know it. That is the, the, the razor thin margin that we are looking at. But even as challenging as the, as the call for 1.5 is, meanwhile, that same report remains a conservative and inaccurate picture of reality. It perpetuates a form of climate denial that bargains with and stretches the truth, leading to more inaction. It creates a false sense that we still have a chance of parking global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius by cutting emissions in half by 2035 and net zero emissions by 2050 using aggressive carbon sequestration techniques so they've added that from what the analysis was before. Um, these have been ineffective, inexpensive, and dubious in practice. For example, sequestered carbon is sold to fracking companies to extract more fossil fuels. That's not gonna get us where we need to be. Whereas the MCC carbon clock, you can look this up on your own, that shows how long we have left in our so-called carbon budget to limit global warming to 1.5, officially ran out of time the day before my birthday last year, September 8th. Based on a medium estimate of the climate's sensitivity to greenhouse gases. Meanwhile, that same institute has since compromised its evaluation by revising its estimate based on the aforementioned IPCC report it arbitrarily added 440 gigatons to our budget for 1.5 by downgrading our chances of, chances of survival from 50% to 33%. In order to disingenuously say that we still have nearly nine years more of present level emissions available when we know that is not true. 
the science, they're not lying, they're just manipulating the figures to uphold that in action. Okay, next. Whereas global average temperatures are now 1.1 C above pre-industrial average, and for each additional half degree of warming, the number and severity of climate impacts doubles. We already have fourfold the impacts we did in, two, in 1950 when we had last seen um, actually normal concentrations of carbon dioxide. So that means that 1.5 degrees will double the impacts we are already experiencing. It's also been said that at 1.5, we base, beyond 1.5, you can say goodbye to the coral, coral reefs. Two degrees Celsius would quadruple the impacts, eightfold at 2.5 degrees, and 16-fold at 3.0 degrees Celsius, and so on. Meanwhile, leading scientists recently published a study warning a domino effect of climate events could easily move the Earth into a hothouse state. Who uh, was familiar with the hothouse Earth article? Definitely recommend checking that out. It was uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and it was um, uh, called the trajectories of something in the Anthropocene or something. Anyway, look for hothouse Earth on your internet searches. So this hothouse state would make efforts to limit uh, greenhouse gases increasingly futile um, because of the consequences of 10 uh, climate change processes that would lead to feedback loops. Uh, examples of these are methane releases in the Arctic, the melting of the Greenland ice sheet, and the loss of coral reefs as a few examples, as each of these is a feedback loop that could amplify the other feedback loops. Whereas promises made as part of the Paris Climate Agreement would lead to about three degrees C of warming by 2100, and the Trump administration recently released an analysis that four degrees Celsius of warming would occur if the neo-colonial world continues to take no action. I know that earlier in the conference and earlier in this week, I've mentioned that there's inaction on climate and that might be bringing feelings up for people that feel like, hey, we've gotten a lot done. Um, you'll keep reading, I'll keep reading, but I just want to acknowledge that that's something that's been coming up. So meanwhile, the Paris Climate Accord attempts to convince us that world governments wish to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, but according to, according to statistical studies, which I already mentioned, we only have a 1% chance of succeeding. Meanwhile, the fossil fuel industry continues to pay no taxes, continues to pollute the water, land, and air, and seize land from indigenous people and people of color. It continues to target indigenous women and women of color with rape culture and insti instigate communal violence while making record profits. Just uh, if you're not sure about that, look up missing and murder murdered indigenous women and look up uh, Standing Rock as one example. Whereas scientists have warned that a path toward a hothouse state would lead to much higher global average temperature than at any time in the past 1.2 million years, and to sea levels significantly higher than any time in the Holocene. Meanwhile, humanity has already wiped out 60% of animal populations since 1970, and plummeting insect numbers threaten the collapse of nature. In 2015, scientists declared that the planet is in mass extinction. So I just want to sit with that for a second. What I challenge us all to look for are ways that we talk about action, but we're not actually acting. We want to like uh, convene a committee to convene another committee to organize a meeting to do community engagement, which will be another meeting that will lead to a consultant that will process those results, and then that'll be put out for a public hearing where we'll gather input for the public hearing to do another study and create a report that will uh, inform the next report and so on. So just look out for that. 
Meanwhile, there is definitive evidence that climate change has been largely caused by only 90 corporations, overwhelmingly owned and controlled by Meanwhile, indigenous peoples, people of color, women, queer and trans people, youth, and people on the front lines continue to put their bodies in the way of fossil fuel extraction to protect life as we know it. Okay, almost done with the blah, blah, blah science stuff. Whereas the International Energy Agency, the IEA, in 2011, said we must stop investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure by 2017 to have a chance of limiting global warming to two degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, since the signing of the Paris Accord in 2015, banks in the United States alone increased their investments in fossil fuel infrastructure tenfold from $59 billion to $580 billion. That's just in the last year. That is the effect of the current federal administration. Therefore, there is no such thing as locking in intermediate warming at temperatures over two degrees Celsius. There's this kind of intellectual mind that makes us think that we can park global warming at any ab arbitrary temperature and, and think that, it, yeah, it's better, you know, three's better than three and a half, or four's better than six. Yeah, we'll get what we can. These arguments that I've put forth are based on all this research. You can do it yourself, too. And I'm telling you, we aren't going anywhere as long as we, we have to keep it below what Paris said, not what they're doing, is what we need. So therefore, we must now do something we've only once done before. We must, uh, I'm basically talking about World War II, mobile, that kind of climate mobilization. We must now create an entirely new system whose sole function is to protect and preserve life on Earth against the tyranny of the fossil fuel empire. And simultaneously, we must dismantle the old system that protects the fossil fuel empire. <laughs> Existing institutions have failed us and will continue to fail us. We must create new institutions that disrupt and innovate. Older institutions must be hospiced and shut down. <laughs> Explicit plans for this transition must be made in any case. Therefore, in creating new institutions, we must be careful not to perpetuate the patterns of the old institutions that failed us. In order to successfully do this, we must use principles of organizing for rapid and just climate action, outlined in Article 2 of this document. These radical principles disrupt the systems of oppression. Without them, it is not possible to create a system that will protect life. I'm gonna say that again. These radical principles, which I'm about to share with you, disrupt the systems of oppression. Without them, it is not possible to create a system that will protect life. So next, Article 2. Forefront in our motivation is to protect life on this planet. How and whether we choose to do so and whether we choose to work together will determine our success. Therefore, we shall work with the following principles. The first five are justice principles. We will practice anti-patriarchy. Actually, let me take a pause. If you have um, pen and paper and you wanna, you don't have to write all these down. Don't even try. <laughs> There's many of them. But if one of the principles stands out, I encourage you to write that one down that stands out. We will practice anti-patriarchy, anti-racism, decolonization, and just transition. 
How many folks have heard of Just Transition? Uh, so Just Transition is a strategy framework. It's a climate justice strategy framework for transitioning from an extractive economy that's based on digging, burning, and dumping uh, both the planet and people uh, to a living economy that supports life and people and everything that we're working to create. In order to recenter humanity, dismantle capitalism, and build a living economy. We will acknowledge our privileges and apply them in service of the movement. We will stand up to dismantle and reconsider our access to power. We will confront our own fragility. We will take time for feedback to improve how we show up, reflect, and rest. We will do inner work to be able to share experiences with each other truthfully in order to have trusting relationships. Those are the justice principles. The second category are principles for showing up. We will show up with urgency and radicalism, including engaging in nonviolent direct action to disrupt systems of oppression. We will find joy in taking action and have fun working together in community, even though the work is serious and challenging. Uh, there's a quote that sticks with me every day that I do this work. It was from David Johnston, uh, who is one of the people involved in the founding of the Green Building Council. And he says, if you're not having fun, you're not taking this seriously enough. Okay, these are still the um, principles of showing up. We will meet people's needs and include everyone in the movement regardless of their level of ability and achieve this by having roles that explicitly create accessibility. We will literally reduce greenhouse gas emissions and sequester carbon dioxide. We acknowledge the need for and role of community organizers and will work to support and uplift them. I'm speaking on behalf of community organizers, not just myself. We will acknowledge that we are much more than our bodies. In order to have a just movement, we must have a spiritual movement. We will show up as whole people to treat ourselves and each other as humans. People need, to support, need support to be able to show up. For example, eating food, drinking water, taking rest, having shelter. There are a lot of folks in the audience that are uh, being involved in the houselessness and affordable housing conversation. If you're involved in that movement or are connected to it, please raise your hand and, and be recognized. Thank you. It's very important and also to have access for transportation. So I appreciate organizers making space for people that need help getting where they need to go after this conference. Anytime we must leave a part of ourselves or anyone out of a conversation or a movement, we are acting from and perpetuating systems of oppression. So I'm gonna take my own advice All right, how are we doing? We're getting through them, thank you. Okay, the next six principles are about accountability. We will center the people most impacted in our decision making, including but not limited to place-based communities. We're in a place-based community here. In order to acknowledge history and prioritize historic grassroots and community-based leadership. We will apply and practice transformational justice principles to hold each other and ourselves accountable. We will acknowledge feelings actively, find and give space for healing and grief work, hold each other's humanity, and cultivate compassion. 
We will uphold progressive stack in visible and transparent ways. For example, by following the lead of being accountable to and prioritizing the needs of and lifting up the voices of historically marginalized people, indigenous and native people, women of color, people of color, femme, queer and trans youth and disabled people. And we will specifically center youth organizing, providing mentoring when appropriate. How many folks were at the youth action on Thursday? Awesome, thank you all for showing up and for showing up to this one too. We will seek to create safety for everyone, particularly those who are marginalized, but we will not compromise the safety of marginalized people to protect the safety of those with privilege. Those are the principles around accountability. So some of the questions that came up earlier in my workshop were what does accountability mean? Accountability means different things to different people in different contexts. Um, these are the accountability principles for rapid and just climate action, which are different from the accountability principles for our organization, for the people. We have our own accountability statement. I have my own accountability definition for myself and how I show up. And to me, understanding accountability is about understanding who we are. It, it helps inform how we show up in the world, what our responsibility is. Okay, the next five principles are strategy principles. We will take action that builds power within communities, centers local and place-based priorities, and creates a regenerative economy. For example, by, creating, by using Just Transition Framework to change the way we make decisions. I'm not gonna read those, they're right here, but you can look them up yourself, Just Transition Framework. That's uh, available on the, um, through the Climate Justice Alliance. We will prioritize work on just transition, community organizing, public education, and storytelling over climate science, policy advocacy, or clean energy technology. Now, I know there are a lot of policy advocates in the room, a lot of clean energy folks in the room, and a lot of scientists. I'm not saying that we don't do those things. We must continue to do what we've already been doing. And I'm asking that we add these additional principles to what we already do to supercharge our movement and make it more inclusive and accountable and more powerful so that we can get the job done. We absolutely need policy, science, and technology, but we don't only need those things. We will educate ourselves in and follow climate justice principles. There are thousands of papers and documents about climate justice, you can look it up on your own. We will, this is gonna be a little controversial. We will oppose false technical solutions such as geoengineering, new sources of hydropower, fracked gas as a bridge fuel, and new nu nuclear fission reactors. And false capitalist <laughs> solutions and false capitalist solutions such as carbon offsets, revenue neutral carbon taxes, and cap and trade. We will confront internalized climate denial within the climate justice community and within ourselves, which historically and continually causes inaction and inadequate incrementalism. We will not waste time confronting climate, the climate denial industrial complex. All right, the next set of four are for innovation. So in addition to social justice principles, there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from other sectors and other um, ways of organizing. And um, so that's what these innovation principles are. We will co-create a rapid and just climate action pattern language that focuses on actual action at every level, including household, neighborhood, community, city, county, etc., and by defining action categories, case studies, models, visions, and goals. That is the work that you all need to do. These are the principles, and those goals and visions and action plans are up to the folks in this community. There's already some work been done to, to make that possible with the uh, drawdown framework and the 
kind of focus areas for the whole conference and for this afternoon. We will employ agile methodology to prioritize action, build practices in collaboration, and guarantee ongoing success within the capacities of each group. Did you know that the software industry in the 1990s was in an existential crisis? I don't know the exact statistic, but something like 80% of all software projects were failing. And millions of dollars were going into these projects, and that was not sustainable. So they were forced, the software industry was forced to come up with new ways of organizing that were rooted in anti-patriarchy, that were rooted in self-determination, that were supporting self-organizing teams, that acknowledged that programmers actually knew how to program. We can do the same thing in our movements. We can apply the lessons learned in the software world. We can apply the lessons learned in the manufacturing world about how to be effective and take these actions. So I encourage you to look at agile methodology. It might be a little technical, so we might just have to have another conversation or workshop. We will make the most of every opportunity to meet and gather using liberated facilitation techniques that do not perpetuate the current patriarchal and capitalist standards. It should no longer be acceptable to have talking heads all the time and public hearings where you only get two minutes to speak and there's no audience participation. We need to transform how we engage with the public, how we engage with each other. We will use the best available tools to manage our work to be effective while consciously avoiding complicity in oppressive nonprofit industrial complex tactics. Raise your hand if you know what the nonprofit industrial complex is. Okay, now raise your keep your hands up. Now raise your hand if you've heard of the prison industrial complex, the healthcare industrial complex. Keep them going. Uh, the military industrial complex. How about the white savior industrial complex? <laughs> There's all these industrial complexes that are about um, building in systems that are self-perpetuating that don't actually solve problems. Okay, those are the innovation principles. Um, I appreciate you bearing with me while I read this document. There's only one section left. The last five principles are the solidarity principles. We will be in service of the movement by being in solidarity with social justice movements, and we will organize to address intersecting issues at the same time. We will be in relationship with the climate justice movement at all scales, locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. We will ensure affinity groups in which we participate agree on practices and develop working agreements. We will stand in solidarity with, network with, and hold accountable other statements, declarations, and movements when needed. There are a lot of declarations out there. The LEAP Manifesto, the Lotofen Declaration, Sunrise Movement, the Agenda for Black Lives, um, the Zero Hour Platform, There's all, they're all out there. And we can learn about them and be in solidarity with, but also challenge them to be as accountable as possible. We will acknowledge the struggles of communities we are as yet not aware of, and we are willing to learn and grow with them. Endorsements. We, the undersigned, pledge to heed the emergency call of action, adhere to these principles, and work together to support the movement to achieve a rapid and just transition. We call on others to join in working with us by also endorsing this document. That is the culmination of years of work to, and working with other folks to build this out. And it's a living document it continues to evolve, and I look forward to working with you on it. As part of my accountability, I'm not yet ready to release copies of this to everyone. 
But if you are in relationship with me or want to build a re an authentic relationship with me, I'm happy to share them with you in conversation, in relationship, in dialogue. And I look forward to working with organizations, Thurston Climate Action Team, the Thurston Climate Reality Group, and any other groups that, um, that we can build these relationships in order to do what is necessary. And what I'm saying that is necessary in summary of all of that is we must build a connected, accountable, and response-able movement. It is, a, it is time to transition together now. It is time to transition together now. It is time to transition together now. If you were in an emergency, would you do the least that you could do? Or would you do everything that you can do? Thank you very much.